Thank you very much. Uh, looking over the, um, the the kind of roster of speakers, I didn't really know what the tone would be here, uh, like here, and, and I see it's kind of a lot of people are thinking along the same lines I am about the, the Internet of Things. So I'm not so big on slogans. They always seem like uh, figments of the marketing department. I know at MIT and especially the Media Lab, they kind of generate these slogans one a week. But uh, the, the Internet of Things seems to be kind of the next next big thing. And you can, you can see you know, that there's a, a little bit of a problem there. Slogans have a certain shelf life to them. And uh, as they get older, you tend to see the ideology and the marketing angles behind them. Uh, this is a slogan uh, that a, an artist named Les Levine, a, a conceptual artist, uh, in, invented. Maybe it's a little more ominous than uh, the Internet of Things, but it's all the same. Uh oh. Sorry. We got a janky connection. Oh, sorry. Okay, we good? So uh, what's this Internet of Things all about? Uh, it's not new. This is the Internet refrigerator, circa 2000. You know, they, they made these things with scanners, and the whole idea was that uh, you were supposed to order orange juice, that, that they would order your orange juice for you. And no one seemed to want them. Uh, this is a much newer one. Does anyone have one of these things or even seen one? <laughs> I, I think this is technology. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was looking for a good picture of this, this item here. It's kind of a science fiction. It's just, it's so wonderful, the fact that you could... Uh, Someone could hack your refrigerator. So uh, get, get that service pack 2 installed on your refrigerator, <laughs> which is one reason why I don't expect these things to succeed. Nobody wants to have to uh, kind of babysit appliances in that way. Uh, yeah, this was in the same article. Got a, a Bluetooth toothbrush. <laughs> and you may be asking yourself why. You know, maybe they save. Check up on your kids, find out how long they've been brushing. Email if they haven't, haven't brushed their teeth today. Uh, so, things. Nobody seems to know it's kind of open ended. It, these are the features that I just wrote down off the back of my little, little bit of thinking, you know, kind of a napkin notes or something. Uh, more consumer electronics to buy. This is definitely the kind of chip maker's attitude. We all need this stuff everywhere. Um, but of course there's limits to how many gizmos we want to deal with and they all have kind of a bandwidth hit that they take on our lives. Uh, but anyway, here's the stuff that makes it possible. Uh, ubiquitous wireless tech, cheap radios, Cheap sensors and new varieties of sensors. Uh, if you think that the scientists are driving this uh, sensors, I think you'd be wrong. But the, the huge driver for sensors is smartphones right now. So all these kind of cheap accelerometers and uh, uh, gyroscopes and um, uh, well, I'm not thinking of the other chips, but in, in any case, it's uh, it's driven by cell phones mainly right now. Uh, big databases, big data, ability to capture data from objects and environments. So uh, potentially any environment can be instrumented, fit out, fit out with sensors. Uh, ability to control anything from your cell phone in an interactive fashion. That's kind of utopian, you know. Obviously. These things aren't all hooked up together yet. There are a few, some problems with that. 
uh, ubiquitous surveillance, who owns the data, uh, end of privacy, uh, young people kind of just think that they're, you know, they're, they're saying what about privacy, they think, you know, it's gone and no use worrying about it for into the future. Uh, almost perfect uh, law enforcement and political control. Um, but it doesn't feel like a police state yet, does it? Well, maybe unless you're in Guantanamo, uh, which is still going on. And the, what's going on in Guantanamo now is that the U.S. government is uh, force feeding people with tubes. So, so much for torture. Okay, anyway, that was my political rant and analysis. So. Uh, physical computing for um, and electronics for artists. So what do artists do with this stuff? I just wanted to show you things that artists do with it. And uh, some of the stuff that I do with my students. And then finally, I'll have a few words about uh, open source electronics. This is a painting done in, in uh, 1965 by Lowell Nesbitt, who was an abstract painter, but he, he had a, uh, an avant-garde career uh, painting uh, architecture and flowers, kind of fresh flowers. You know, they, they weren't necessarily kind of uh, <coughs> kitschy flowers um, in large paintings in, in New York City. And he, he walked into this IBM showroom and uh, he saw these machines, and they just kind of radiated a certain kind of symbolism of power at the time. You know, it was obvious which way things were going. And he did this whole series of IBM uh, mainframes, you know, the tape drives and the stuff you really only see on uh, science fiction movies and old newsreels, old uh, documentaries. So uh, artists can go on kind of, um, um, you know, it's been said that art is kind of a museum for extinct technologies. That we keep going these extinct technologies, like intaglio printing on copper plates. But it's much more fun to kind of dig in ourselves to the technology and very rewarding. So I'm going to just show you a few pieces. Uh, this is a piece by uh, one of my students. I'm not sure I really taught him anything. It's mostly a, a, a programming piece. But the piece uh, tries to sell itself on the internet. So, so when you buy the thing, you agree to always plug it into the internet. So it's, it's always uh, uh, plugged in, and it, and it posts an auction for itself on eBay. So it's always kind of auctioning itself to, to, to someone else. And uh, it's, it's apparently worth $7,500. The artist has had offers from collectors to buy the thing, but they want to want him to agree that they own that they can actually own the piece for three years, which is kind of not the meaning of the piece. So. This is a tech uh, tech piece by a Dutch artist named uh, Vin Del Roy, and, and I'm not totally certain of the pronunciation of that. Uh, called Cloaca, and it's it's um, a robotic piece, and it, it, it it's uh, basically a working model of the human digestive tract. So, uh, I mean, it could be the most useless robot. You know, it's kind of instead of mirroring humans' muscles, it's mirroring the uh, the digestive tract and the power plant of humans. And yes, it does poop. There's its poop. <laughs> and he sells the poop. Uh, he showed this in New York, and he got all these high-end restaurants to donate food. So they were putting hundred-dollar meals into the thing three times a day. Uh, this is an artist uh, named Jim Campbell, who actually has an MIT uh, connection. He was an electrical engineer here. Uh, okay, now I need to get on the internet. Sorry about this. What am I looking for? Uh, I 
yes. That one will play nice with me. Okay, let's see. Let's see if this works. Sound here? I didn't know what it was when you were as a kid. Um, let me check this. Let's go this through. In image processing and high definition television. As an artist, Campbell draws on his technical expertise to explore the aesthetics of low resolution video displays. I've been off and off actually at the same company in Silicon Valley for almost 20 years, and up until very recently, all of the people that I work with in the company well, sort of had no idea what I do. Right. do. So, in the interest of time, Sorry. The information I took to actually see a recognizable moving image. How many? We have so many the these years, Jim has been producing a series no, of LED works which is titled Ambiguous Icon. Today, he's installing one group of these works, the Motion and Rest Studies, at San Francisco Exploratorium. I'm looking at the motion of six people who were disabled who have disabilities. And I was interested in isolating their movement from everything about their person. In an odd way, they are perfectly politically incorrect, but at the same time, they're perfectly politically correct. I say that because they're completely defining the person by the disability. On the other hand, there's nothing to associate that characteristic with because you know nothing else about the person. So they're sort of riding this edge. Jim has paid the price for riding this edge. A major U.S. museum declined to show the motion and rest of studies, fearful that the public would find them exploitative. An ironic twist given Jim's deeply personal reason for his choice of subject. Both of my parents were detained. All right, I think that's good. Um, the art world loves controversy, though, so those were, you know, they got, they got a, lo a lot of. Uh, uh, interest in the art world. Well, we're freaking out the computer here. Okay, good. Uh, sorry. I don't use PowerPoint that often, so uh, every time I get these windows popping up, and every time I switch, it's freaking out. Okay. I know there's a solution to this. I have to try and dismiss that window without having it show up. Um, I mean, it's not going to show up here. It's only, I can get yeah, it there. Yeah, it's zapping. See what happens there. So, <coughs> okay. so I'll try this. Um, I don't know. All right. Is that good? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, this, this is a uh, next piece is a piece that was actually shown at MIT about four years ago. This is a very famous piece in electronic air. And again, in the interest of this, it's called listening post. I am. Sessions. <coughs> I'm an east side. I'm a white side. So these were uh, a couple hundred vacuum fluorescent displays. I am an artist. You can see all the power and data for the whole uh, column is running on four wires there, or maybe it's only two wires. No, it looks like there's four. I am not repeating. I am a student here. I am still used to windows. I am from Argentina. I am proud of not being British. I'm the least of Canada, not me. I'm the Victoria Lightner. Let's see if we'll get back to the show in a slick way. Got it. Okay. Um, so what was going on with that um, that piece? It, it has about four or five computers in it that are just mining the internet and, and uh, internet chat rooms. Uh, so this is five years ago, which seems kind of like a lifetime in uh, electronic uh, media. Uh, so I, I wonder how the piece operates today because chat rooms have kind of been subsumed, <coughs> subsumed by Facebook. So things. Things probably look a little different today. Uh, this is one of my own pieces. This is my actually first physical computing piece. I had made some electronics uh, in high school and also uh, after art school. I was in a punk band and we built kind of homemade synthesizers that were, were really fun. Thank you. Thank you for accepting my seat in Teletics. detector to, so it would be a little smaller. And, uh, so this is a, uh, a basic stamp, which is also kind of ancient history, and a voice chip. Uh, here's some student work from uh, my students, the kind of stuff that they do. Uh, this is a, a woman named Diane Eng, who has made a little name for herself doing uh, technical education in New York City. This is a dust buster here on the back. And they put another nozzle on it and built some kind of uh, custom valve so that the, uh, the dust buster could either inflate or deflate the, uh, the inflatable dress. Uh, this, this tail kind of blows up into a uh, stegosaurus. <coughs> it was really fun. It was really fun. Um, This is a recent student that um, I taught a course about the body, and uh, she made this little voodoo doll that's cross-coupled uh, wirelessly with uh, technology that she's wearing on her head. 
So the, so the eyes are kind of cross-coupled, and you'll see it in the video a little bit. Nice. So we can focus on the dog. Um, and then that's it, It's really subtle, but the eyes are closing. <laughs> So these are just like some uh, some sample eyes that I was making. Um, so she has these prostheses that she's wearing. They're kind of hooked up to her her uh, eyelids. This was just a very simple LED assignment. Uh, first assignment for students. Most of these students have not made a circuit in their lives, so. Uh, this is just kind of an easy thing to get them going. Uh, a sconce that an ID student did. This was a beautiful little cone of sugar, kind of uh, fused sugar in the uh, in the kind of mode of creme brulee. So the kind of a snuggly thing that one student made. I don't think this was wearable. I think it was just some kind of abstract snuggly that had interior orifices that lit up. These are just soda straws with LEDs in them. These are uh, eggs and the student has just uh, clipped LED to uh, coin cells and put them in there so there's no real on switch. They, they just stay in there and uh, uh, glow until the batteries go dead. Uh, I do programming with students. Um, I have to teach them how to program. So most of my students have not done either electronics or programming. So it's kind of a tall order to get them up to speed in these in these two fields. You know, and I tell them, oh, look, I'm not going to teach you to be an electron uh, a double E in electrical engineer in uh, in one semester. Uh, but it's enough of a, an introduction, so they feel very empowered. They feel like they can kind of take the next steps on their own if, if they're really interested. So this is, th these are uh, Arduino kind of chip music programming. This one's more of kind of punk, noise music, aggressive. these little musical instruments with uh, uh, homebrew Arduinos uh, that, I'll, that I'll show you later. Um, and we plug them into the amp and the speaker uh, in the classroom and rock out. This is a, um, uh, we get them going with LCDs and speakers, so this is a little project with LCDs. sound. I mean, it's just whatever video we capture during critiques. 
So, uh, you know, this is halfway through the semester and they've already kind of hooked up two or three things. So this is how easy it, electronics have become these days with uh, open source hardware and software. This is a similar one, uh, an LCD built into a shoe. And uh, the LCD is what the uh, piston sensor. So if you're, there's nothing you know, near the business as you just said, so that's an issue with the pattern. When it goes closer, um, it will say that it washes that uh, nice that check out and show this. It's all good. I said, well, thank you. Now we're doing it. Fire and man. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, so like you do. Like, Uh, these are some some um, some of my open source hardware practice. These are things that I engineered for my students, and then later I decided I would see if anyone else wanted the same technology, and it turned out to be pretty popular. So I have a web shop, and it's kind of eaten my life for the past five years. <laughs> This is the fir actually the first Arduino kind of work-alike clone uh, called the Bare Bones Board. Uh, going back about five years now. And the whole idea was to make it fit on one of these wireless grid boards. Uh, I don't know. The, you know about Arduinos. You probably a lot of you have seen them. Uh, this was a, a little board that I built with, a, with an even more minimal Arduino on it. So there's a programming dongle that kind of removes some of the functionality and price from it. So if, if you're going to want the very minimum embedded in, in a project, so the idea was to, to remove the uh, uh, USB FTDI chip that does the USB communication. Uh, and this is a Dutch, a Dutch artist and I are uh, not artist, engineer and I are collaborating on this wireless series. So we basically took this board and re-engineered the thing and put a little inexpensive wireless radio. I mean, to give you an idea, these radios are three dollars, <laughs> and they go about a uh, hundred yards. So they're they're just enough power. Uh, to kind of communicate things. And, and mostly the, the market for these are people kind of wiring up their homes, gathering data on their own homes. Although I've sold these things to, um, uh, there was a big project of a grad student um, at UC Davis that wanted to, um, he, he put little boxes on showers and had people just kind of uh, press a button when they started their shower and press a button when they stopped it to see if you could get people to take uh, shorter showers if they knew that it was kind of being timed. It was an interesting research. Uh, there's another um, people that are developing a, a proprietary device in um, Australia that measures heat flow through a wall. So they've got a, a module on each side of a wall, kind of measuring the temperature. I'm not sure about the physics, but they say it's been their their model has been proved. It does work. So it it allows an, an, an engineer to kind of verify the R value and the insulation of a of a wall, and it uses these little radios to kind of get through the wall. And they they built it all off of open source stuff. So this. This uh, G-Lab stuff has, has uh, generated a whole ecosystem. There's a whole lot of them, and there's kind of plug-and-play sensors to go in here. This is a, uh, a pulse sensor that I built. This was a little $2 chip that was made for cell phones again. Uh, it has LED drivers built into it, so there's two infrared. LEDs and there's a, a, a visible light LED. 
Uh, and I thought it might be possible to build a PSO2 sensor, a, a oxygen saturation sensor, and, and, and pulse. So, you know, with a, with a handful of parts, basically about 350 of parts, you know, I built this kind of really inexpensive hobbyist sensor. Uh, the, um, this chip there, the intended application for this chip was something that would sense your cheat when you were on the phone and turn the display off. Because uh, saving power is a big issue with, you know, no one likes their mobile appliances to go dead. So there, there's a very big push to kind of make low power stuff. Uh, this is my heartbeat here. <clears throat> this is heart rate variability uh, graph down here. The, the time between heart heartbeats. And, and this is a very active uh, area of research. You can look uh, on the internet and find people using heart rate variability for athletic training. Uh, it's also hooked up for, to affect. So uh, it turns out your respiration signal is built into your heartbeat. So all from this little sensor, I'm picking up respiration <coughs> signals here. And I'm kind of uh, meditating here with my eyes closed. And you can see that the signal changes dramatically from when I stop meditating here. And this is just kind of normal breathing. Uh, some final thoughts about open source hardware. Uh, ethics. Uh, do you have to change the same thing to sell it, or can you just kind of make your own copy and go out and sell it? Nobody has really decided any of this stuff, you know, and it's a wild west. And, um, you know, as usual, there's, there's plenty of people kind of just to, <coughs> making this stuff in China and, and, and selling it. So, you know, everything that, that we do kind of gets reused. Uh, my heartbeat sensor, a company that's got a you know, so some kind of startup to make a, they got some uh, investor money to make a, uh, a baby monitor. I don't know why, but there's this kind of big push to make baby monitors right now. Uh, but anyway, they, they bought some of my heartbeat sensors to try out with the chip. There's um, <clears throat> a kind of a low cost way to, to uh, put a heartbeat into the thing. Uh, do we all have to sell the same things? It's kind of along the lines of, you know, the chip makers make the chips. It's great. It allows people like me that probably couldn't engineer chips on their own to use this kind of advanced technology. But it's very easy for people to kind of just make the same thing as, as other open source shops. Uh, can open source solve some big problems instead of just creating low cost versions? So, where is the Linux of open source hardware? Uh, it hasn't really been created yet. But there was one project in Germany that I saw at a conference where um, a guy had made uh, cell phones with a cell phone network. So people in the third world could basically buy these networks, string up a couple of uh, uh, transmitters, and have their own kind of local cell phone network with very low cost phones. So maybe a, a village would uh, you know, buy two or three of these phones, have networks that kind of connected in a mesh to, to other villages that were nearby um, if, if there weren't towers. I haven't checked on it. I don't know how they're doing. And that is the end. So we're way behind schedule. Um, well, that was great. Thank you very much.